in many of the interviews and later with Bob Costas, the host and the guests grooved so heavily that you knew there would be follow-up episodes. And this one from March 18th, 1992 with Eli Wallach is no exception. It goes from talking about how a, a Jewish kid from New York City can go to playing, get to be famous playing Mexican and Italian outlaws. And he explained it was the immigrant coupling in New York that allowed him to do that so well. Also talks about Elia Kazan and Yul Brenner and lots of good stuff that lead up to episode two the next night. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for staying up later. We're happy to have Eli Wallach with us tonight. You know his work from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, The Magnificent Seven, The Misfits, uh, Barbara Streisand film of a few years ago called Nuts. And he's in a film uh, which has just been released a few days ago called Article 99, which we'll talk about in a bit. But is it fair to say that if you're walking down the street, people recognize you, maybe not the real insiders, but the average fan recognizes you from those so-called spaghetti westerns, first and no, foremost? A lot of them do. A lot of young people do. But the older people say, did I, did you used to work in the grocery store somewhere? Did I know you? I knew you from somewhere. Did you know my brother-in-law in Queens? I say, no, no. Really. Or sometimes they say, I like everything you've ever done, Mr. Marshall. They think or, you're E.G. Marshall. Or, or Marty Balsam. Or Jack Warden. Yeah. And so... But I, lo I love that kind of, I, I feel for actors like Paul Newman or uh, these guys, Steve McQueen, they couldn't go anywhere, you know, they'd be mobbed. So this kind of anonymity pleases me. For a guy named Eli from Brooklyn, you played your fair share of Italians and Mexicans, right? Yeah. I grew up with Italians. All I remember as a kid was going to funerals and weddings and masses and... I, I was a Jew in, an in a sea of Italians, and they taught me a lot. Such as? Well, I mean, the, I love Italy. I think if I'd been born earlier, I was Italian. Um, the, the, uh, just the generosity of the people, they, their spirit, I, I, I love them. Now, you left Brooklyn and went off to Texas, right? You went to the University of Texas, and this would have been when, in the 30s or 40s? In the 30s. I couldn't get into City College, which was free, because I didn't have the grades. I hated high school. So my brother found out that Texas was an oil-rich university. The university. It was an oil-rich... Uh, the, the money had been given to the university. Uh -huh. They gave him what they thought was scrub land in West Texas, and it turned out there, were oil, there was oil all over. The tuition was $30 a year. A Even year. for someone from out of state? Huh? Yes, the first year. The second year, I hitchhiked down, and they said, we've raised it for out-of-staters to $100. I said, I can't, can't stay. Or well, they said, we'll get you a job. So I swept the student, universe, student buildings and typed and things like that, so I paid my, my tuition. But I spent four years there with some rather well-known people now. Um, John Connolly, who was mm -hmm. the governor. Zachary Scott, famous actor. Elaine Steinbeck, John's wife, and Walter Cronkite. And Walter and I were in the Curtain Club, in the dra Dramatics Club. Neither one of us could get parts because of our accents. I was from Brooklyn, he was from Missouri. But, uh... Well, on the other hand, you probably had the market cornered on certain parts, because you were the only guy, right? Where? The only guy with a Brooklyn accent. The oh, only. Yeah. But they didn't do many plays with Brooklyn accents, you know. So were you viewed as something of an oddity? I was. And the professors used to call on me constantly in my freshman year because they didn't care about the answer. They just wanted to hear me speak because it was <laughs> so odd, you see. It was like coming from one planet to another. But what Texas taught me is honor, truthfulness, loyalty. That I learned there. Which of the uh, so-called spaghetti westerns was the best one? The good, the bad, and the ugly. I love when I first met the director. He said to me, I don't want you, he didn't speak English. He said in, in French and Italian, I want you to put your, not have a holster for your gun. I said, where do I put it? 
He says, you wear a lanyard, and it, it hangs around your neck. And I said, it dangles between my legs, right? He said, yeah. And when you want it, you twist your shoulders, and I cut to your hand, and there's the gun. I said, show me. He put it on. He went like this. It missed. It hit him in the groin. He said, keep it in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I had fun with that, with that movie. That was you and, and Eastwood and, and Lee Van Cleef, right? Lee Van Cleef, yeah. Well, what a face on Lee Van Cleef. He just looked like a bad guy, right? That yeah. evil he had one glint thing in his of, eye. He had one finger missing. I don't know how it happened. But he had one, and Leone was forever cutting to that one finger. Yeah, just before he was set to draw yeah. against Eastwood, they kept yeah. cutting to the hand, poised. Yeah. yeah. I remember I, I had to ride a horse across the sand, across the desert toward the camera. And Leone said, when I go like this, you come. So he goes, and I come. The horse goes halfway, stops, spreads his legs, throws me off, and scratches his back in the sand. I said, I'm not going to do it anymore. This horse... He's not a movie horse. He doesn't pay any attention to what you're saying. <laughs> I don't want to do it. He said, do it, do it. I go back again. The horse spreads his legs, throws me off. I said, no, no, no. He said, I'll take care of it. They sent the wrangler out, a Spanish horseman, yeah. who said something to the horse, reared back and punched him right in the nose. Punched and, the horse? Yeah. And the horse, like Alex Karras in Blazing Saddles. And the horse went... <laughs> and I got back on the horse, and he came right across the desert. <laughs> A lot of people say Eastwood is an underrated actor because so much of it was, you know, kind of image and physical action and uh, Dirty Harry stuff. And a lot of people within the craft say this guy's a much better screen presence than people realize. You, if you look at his record as, as a director, you'll see that he knows the medium. He knows how to put a story across. I mean, he's done a number of movies that he starred in and directed. So he's, yes, he's a wonderful screen actor. Steve McQueen, you know, when we were doing The Magnificent Seven, he said, kept saying to them, take my lines and give them to somebody else. I don't want to say very much, because he was a reactive actor. He lived his life, and you were always glued to him when he was on the screen. Same with Eastwood. They're very smart screen actors. What do you recall about uh, The Magnificent Seven? It was obviously, there was, a, there was a, a Japanese movie, The Seven Samurai, which is a Kurosawa movie, and this is... A, a direct remake of that. Yes. I said, I want to play the crazy samurai. Oh, they said, no, that's the love interest. I said, what do you want me to play? They said, the head bandit. I said, well, I saw the Japanese movie. He had an eye patch, and all you saw were the eye patch and the hoofs of the horse. Then I read the script. I said, I'm only in the first 20 seconds of the movie. Then for the next hour and a half, you don't see me. Then I thought, wait a minute, that's why I want to do the part. I come in in the beginning, I shoot somebody, I ride out, and the next hour they talk about, he's coming back. When is he coming? When? That's all they talk about in the movie. So I did it. I put two gold teeth in, and I thought to myself, you see all these westerns where they hold up the bank or they rob the train? You never see what, the, what they do with the money. Never. So I thought, why don't I show what they do with the money? So I wore silk shirts, I put gold teeth in, I had a pearl-handled gun, I had a beautiful horse with the, the saddle Marlin used in one-eyed jacks, silver saddle, so you could see where my wealth was. <laughs> Yul Brenner was in this. Yul Steve Brenner. McQueen, Charles Bronson in it, right? Yep. Uh, James Coburn, Robert Vaughn, mm -hmm. and Brad Dexter. At one point, Yul Brenner shot me. <laughs> and I lie back like this. And the director said, I want the light to go out of your eyes. I said, how the hell am I going to get the light out of my eyes? So I'm lying there. My, I took my son to see it. He was about six years old. He said to me, gee, Dad, couldn't you outdraw Yul Brynner? place like this. Why? A man like you. Why? How'd you make the light? 
go out of your I eyes. I unfocus the eyes. You can do it. Do it. Just unfocus them? Yeah. No, I can't do it. You, you see? That's screen. why I'm doing this and you're over here. <laughs> you didn't pass the screen test. <laughs> T take off your glasses and do it. That's it. See, for me, I'm still working on a perfect, we'll be back right after this. I mean, that's the, that's the full range of my artistic expression, so. So you have to focus. <laughs> I'd like you to meet a friend of mine, Gay? Yeah. Gay Langland, this is Tabor. How'd he do? And this is Mrs. Uh... Steers, Isabel Steers. One thing about Reno men, they do remember the name. Why don't you boys sit down? Thank you. What you girls drinking? Whiskey. We're celebrating the jail burn down. Uh, Mary, see if you can get four doubles, will you? The Misfits was the last... Was it the last movie for uh, Marilyn Monroe, or was that Bus Stop? No, Bus Stop was made long before. The, the her Misfits was movie. her last. She was it started, also Gable's last? Yeah. She started another film, but didn't finish it. They fired her. Gable died, a, died of a heart attack ten days after we finished the movie. Monty Cliff died about two years later, as did Marilyn as did Thelma Ritter, as did James Barton. As a matter of fact, in a couple of months, I'm going back to Reno. They're raising money for an old people's home down there, and I'm the last survivor, and they're showing the movie. What was Monroe like? I think, I think she's grossly underrated as an actress. If you see uh, The Prince and the Showgirl with Laurence Olivier, I saw him do it on the stage with Vivian Lee. Marilyn was brilliant in the movie. Then the, the, what was the one she did with Tony Perkin, uh, Tony Curtis? Some Like Some It like Hot, Billy Wilder. She was wonderful in that. I, I think she was a lovely actress, deeply disturbed, and uh, I felt sorry for her. I loved her, but I felt sorry for her. There are all kinds of ironies in her life, but The Misfits is a particular irony. She plays this divorcee. She's just about out of hope, doesn't know where her uh, her life is going. This thing is written by Arthur Miller. Their marriage is dissolving, or maybe already has dissolved. As we're and, shooting. And, and she's mouthing his words. Exactly. And that made us sicker. I love what she said at one point. We were on overtime after three and a half months. We, were, we moved to Los Angeles from Reno. And uh, we were on overtime, and Clark Gable was getting $50,000 a week overtime. So she'd come... The call was 8.30 in the morning. She'd get there 10 after 10, or quarter to 11. So she rushed in and threw her arms around Clark Gable and said, I'm so sorry I'm late. I really am. He said, there's no hurry, honey. No hurry. <laughs> <laughs> but he was understanding and understood her plight, and so did Houston. Houston was wonderful with her. It's, it's strange. Some, the, the mere act of living sometimes can be very painful for people. And she had that pain, and so did Monty Clift. What was it about Clift that was so captivating? Well, he was vulnerable. He was sensitive. He was a lovely actor. I love... He, he went on to ten different rodeos before we started the movie. Got thrown off horses and all. Came in with a... He was doing the method. Came with a bruise across his nose and so on. And the first day his shot was to go into a phone booth. Do you remember the movie? Mm -hmm. He goes into a phone booth and calls his mother. And we're sitting there in the car, Gable, Monroe, me, and Thelma. And he calls his mother and has a, a minute and a half scene. That's a long time on screen. He did it, and Houston said, cut, print it, let's move to the next location. And Monty said, no, you can't. I have to do it again. No, he said, you'll never do it better. So that, he did it perfectly the first time. Hello? Hello? Hello, Ma? This is Paris. Yeah, I'm okay. No, I was in Colorado. I'm in Nevada now. Just won me a bull ride. Yeah. Yeah, but pretty good rodeo. Hundred dollars. 
Ma, I, I was going to buy you a birthday present with it, but I was coming out of my poof. He was, he was an excellent actor. Did he have a poor sense of how good he was, though? That kind of suggests to me if he says, I need to do it again, maybe he didn't believe act, in his own. A lot of actors do. You see, in the movies, in the theater, if I do a performance, I'm evaluating it in my mind. The next night I come back and think, I've got another crack at it. See, baseball, the guy says he's in a slump. Eventually, he's going to come out of it. I don't know why I keep referring to baseball with you, but I do. He, he comes out of the slump. In the movies, they say, cut, do it again, do it again, do it again. And he's unsure of how many times he's going to do it. Yeah. If I have to say to you, hiya, Bob, they say, cut, that wasn't right. Do it again. Hiya, Bob. Hiya, Bob. And after a while, it doesn't make sense. Hiya, Bob. Hiya, Bob. Right? <laughs> so that's what happens in, in movies. That's why the actor says, can I do it one more time? Because I think this time I can get it right. In my first movie, I kept saying to Kazan, he said, cut, print it. Print one and three. I'd say, wait a minute, can I do one more, one more? He'd say, sure. Film is not expensive. I'll do it again. I'll shoot it. He never printed when I asked to do it again. What he was saying to me is, my eye is the objective eye. I'm out there watching it. Mm -hmm. You don't know it. So don't, don't ask to do it again. And I didn't after that. A film of yours that, that I really liked, uh, maybe you'd be surprised that I'd pick it out with, with all the films, but was the Barbara Streisand movie, Nuts. And I thought, I know Barbara Streisand, I guess, isn't, isn't popular in some quarters, as was evidenced this year when Prince of Tides got all the nominations, but she didn't get a Best Director nomination. But I thought she should have been nominated for Best Actress for her performance in Nuts a few years ago. I thought that was one of the most underrated performances I've seen in recent years. She was tremendous. I, I think she's, a, she's an extraordinary talent, and uh, she's a perfectionist, and she has little patience for mediocrity, and that makes her fair game out there. I, I was a, her prison psychiatrist in this thing, yeah. and I testified first. So when I finished, I had to go sit out in the courtroom, so I said to the director, Martin Ritt, do I still have to sit out there for the next six weeks while all the others are testifying? He said, yes, because when I turn the camera around from them, I want to see you. So after three weeks, I'm, I'm sitting there waiting, waiting, hour after hour. I went up to him and said, I have to leave. He said, why? I said, you forget, I'm a psychiatrist. I have other patients. I... <laughs> he, he, said, he said, get out there and sit there, damn it. So, so I watched. I watched for six weeks sitting out there. But I enjoyed Barbara. She's, she's gifted. Yentl is an underestimated movie, too. There were two movies this year directed by women, and neither one of the women were, were nominated. Uh, the girl named Coolidge, who directed Ramblin' Rose, a beautiful movie, and Prince of Tides, very well directed. Go figure. Go fi I've had my Academy Award speech memorized for 30 years. How many times have you been nominated? Never. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> but neither was Charlie Chaplin or Cary Grant. Those people never got it. I don't know if you've done it more than once, but at least once, uh, the whole family was in a stage production, or at least most of the family, because your two daughters uh, performed with you and Ann Jackson in uh, a stage production of The Diary of Anne Frank, right? That was an, a unique experience, because the play had never been done with a family. To see my two daughters and my wife and myself standing there and hear the Nazis coming up the steps, you know. There's a terrible story they tell about Pia Zadora doing a production of that, and somebody in the audience yelled, she's upstairs, <laughs> which, which I thought was horrible. horrible. <laughs> so, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> Enlisting the audience support and yeah. admiration. <laughs> so I know what... It was, it was, we did it for almost a year. We did it in Canada and in New York. And people used to bring their little children because they wanted them to get the experience of what this family went through. It's extraordinary. Has it helped you in your craft to be married for so many years to Ann Jackson, also a fine performer? Does that help 
compare notes, well, or we, is that just we, a happy coincidence? I, I think it has saved the marriage because it's it, we economized on uh, on psychiatrists and marriage counselors <laughs> because every time we found ourselves in a play that was great, great struggles going on in the play, great fights. We were in Cincinnati or St. Louis in a play called The Waltz of the Toreadors. At the end of the second act, I choked her, choked her. She, she kept saying, you're mine, you're my garbage bin, you belong to me. And I said, no, never, never, no, I'm choking. <laughs> and the usher came back and said, a couple going up the aisle, and the wife said to the husband, do you think he killed her? And the husband said, I hope so. <laughs> so, so, so sometimes it's been a wonderful, wonderfully rewarding for us to act together. A little bit of a catharsis sometimes. Oh, you think yeah. you ever have acted out feelings, be they tender or oh, yes. angry, oh, yes. that didn't naturally come to the surface in oh, yes. real life? In, 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 I had a fight with Anne once before we went on in a play. And in the next scene on the play, I had to say, shut up. Well, it had a color and a quality. You know, you can't find that in rehearsal. The other night, I, I, I had a fight with her, and I went into my bedroom and slammed the door so hard that I locked myself in. And she had to get the super to get me out. So. <laughs> I got a feeling there's more where this half hour came from. So we're going to ask Eli Wallach to come back tomorrow night. He's going to say yes, and we hope you'll be here too. See you later.